it's on to the College World Series Final. The 2015 National Champions. 16 teams remain heading into the second weekend of the college baseball postseason, including the Virginia Cavaliers. It'll be a sold out dish room park this weekend with Kansas State coming in for the Charlottesville Super Regional against the Wahoos. And welcome once again to another postseason edition of 1186, the podcast, the official podcast of the Virginia baseball program. I am Damon Dillman, joined every week by Scott Fitzgerald and Andrew Ramsbacker. And our special guest this week coming in out of the bullpen, the pitching coach of the Virginia Cavaliers. He seems to do his best work this time of year in June. Drew Dickinson joins us. Drew, glad you could make it. And let's start right there. We were talking about this before we started recruit, recording, but um, 2.33 team ERA in the three-game Charlottesville Regional. You go 3-0. Obviously, Jay Wolfick is the, one of the biggest stories around the country of the first weekend. But just your overall impressions – of the way your guys threw the ball this weekend to get the three and zero and on a weekend number two. Well, obviously, yeah, very excited how we threw. Um, I felt like since the Boston College series, we have been building towards this moment of just getting getting whole, if I say right. Especially in the starting rotation, they're getting solidified with Joseph Eno getting built back up, and then we were still kind of him and Han in, in that three hole a little bit, and then we decided to go back to Wolfolk. And if you look at the last like month every outing Jay had, you just saw glimpses of just becoming better. It's just better. And it'd be like one little thing, maybe a home run or something, like just a small mistake, but it was like one mistake. It wasn't three or four or five. Um, and it was just getting more consistent. And he's got the stuff. And this time of year, you need some stuff. You need strikes, right? But strikes and stuff are, are a great combination. And um, we felt that was the best option for us to win that thing. And we went with Jay. And uh, wow, did he not disappoint, right? Um it was unbelievable to see that kind of all come to fruition in that in that environment um, and the way that he did it. I think even after giving up two runs in the first inning and then shutting him down for the next right. seven innings, right, was was phenomenal. And, um, you know, we've always known Jay's had that in him. I know Jay knows that he's had that in him, you know, and it just it just took a little while to get there. And that's OK. You know, do I wish it would have got here back in February? Of course. Right. It'd be a lot easier on the year. But, hey, we are right where we need to be. Right. Two wins away from going back to the promised land. And um, Jay's in a great place. And I'm ex so ecstatic to watch him uh, go out and compete again on Saturday. I was going to ask you, because I remember exchanging pleasantries with you in the outfield while Jay was long tossing before the game and just asking you, hey, how you doing? And you kind of smirked and said, essentially, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> what, 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 what was your best case scenario? Obviously, I can't imagine you went into it saying, you know what, he's going to give us eight plus innings, only give up two runs, only walk one guy. What What were you hoping to get out of him? Uh, you know what? Just I want him to just continue to compete like he had been doing. And when I say that, as like giving us a chance to win. I mean, obviously, he came in his last outing in Florida State and got some length there. And we brought him in wide. We were losing, and we couldn't leave that tournament without him pitching, right? Because if we don't want, he was started on Saturday in the semifinal. Um, so we needed him to get through that and he did a good job. He gave just a one home run on a hanging split, but like you saw, like there's just some, just some glimpses of what's going on, but you still didn't know it's been, had been, I have to ask Scott, but it had been what two months since he has started last, I think. So wake forest maybe. Um, so, but he had been built up by the bullpen had thrown 75 pitches, 80 pitches. So I wasn't worried there. He's always been a strong arm kid. Um, did I think I was going to get eight? A plus with two runs, like no, I mean, I but 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 I'm also not surprised either because of his stuff and what I feel like he has the ability to do is just about putting it together, right? Um, he just happened to put it together on the biggest stage of the year, and it was it was fun to be on be on the sidelines to watch it. Yeah, I, I was a big part of it as a coach, but um, it was great to see, and I'm so proud of him. And I, like I told him, I told him I'm so proud of you, but let's go do it again, right? So. So it's it's exciting, you know. If we would got five or six innings and kept us in the ball game, then we'd have been great, great setup with our bullpen, and he made it even better. And obviously, that six run ninth really helped uh, to kind of extend that lead a little bit. I, I think the at least the image that that sticks with me coming off of that performance was um, in the sixth inning when he picks off Mershon, I think at second base, right? And I don't think I've ever seen a pitcher jump like three straight times in yeah. the air with like both like his vertical was like 
you know, on full display there on the mound. But it, it was kind of like a, it felt like a snapshot of like, yeah, obviously he was pitching well, but there was a certain kind of joy that was kind of flowing through him throughout that performance. As a coach, when you see that, like what what kind of went through your mind and how much kind of fun we, he was having seemingly uh, out there on Sunday night? Well, obviously having fun, but think about that moment, right? Mershon gets a, a leadoff capper single over Jay's head, infield single, right? And you're like, crap. And this guy's our best base runner. has like 28 bags, right? And then he steals second base. So now there's second base, nobody out with their best hitters right in a row. Um, and you're like, all right, we'll just try to minimize this, keep it a 3-3 game. And then he strikes out Jordan. And then we call a one-look pick. And we had this guy. This is the guy we had picked off the other day when Blanco threw the ball in the center field. Same race runner. And he's a great player. And we call it. It's like, great. You know, we haven't we have not really done back-to-back one-look picks, second base all year. It's like, let's call it again. We pick him off, right? And it was a great play. And to see his emotion, like his 40-inch vert, just, just jump to the sky. Uh, it was great because it's an emotional game, right? And but I love when guys are able to show the motion, but then he was able then to come back down and get, get get the next guy out, which I think helped was that review. It was able to, you know, obviously we walked the next guy, but we were we kind of pissed around him a little bit because that's our best home run guy left. Just wasn't a great matchup. I, I was fine with the guy on deck, right, and taking our chances there. But um, I felt like the review helped us kind of calm the moment a little bit because his heart rate, I'm sure, was through the roof. Jay is, is is one example. The way you threw the ball all weekend, but but the, it, this seems to be the story of your time here. Is your pitching staff seem to put all the pieces together? All the stars seem to align when you get into the postseason. I remember talking to you in twenty one when you guys were still down in Columbia, waiting it out between the uh, the regional and the super regional weekend, and like that was the weekend Wyatt emerged. That was the weekend Neek and yep. and uh, Griff and just. What 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 is it? Do you think that allows your pitching staffs again last year too? Obviously, the yeah. way a lot of those guys are too. Just what it what it, is that a strategy or just how is it that these the stars seem to align, the pieces seem to fall into place when you get into June? Right. Well, I think the difference in twenty one and twenty three. If you look like going into the postseason, we were already like a top five. Like I know last year a top five ERA in the country. I know we were probably pretty high there in twenty one as well. I don't remember. So we already had really good pieces, but like sometimes you just need a little bit more, right? I mean, don't matter how good you are, you usually need somebody to step up in those moments. In 21, it was Griff McGarry coming back and just literally being the best pitcher in the country, right? Like nobody could touch him. It was unreal. Throwing a 99 to 102 versus Old Dominion, right? It was like, this is insane. It's like a video game. And the only reason he came out is because he, he could not stop bleeding on his hand. And then Neek comes in and strikes out 16. Right. Like what is happening here? This guy's a one inning guy. He just throws five and two thirds and punches out everybody. Like I remember the game was over. We're like coming down. You're so juiced up. And I, I'm like counting up. Okay. We had six walks. Okay. Whatever. I'm like, wait, 24 strikeouts. And that's gotta be some kind of record. Right. And, and out of 27 outs and you're like, you're just in a blur of what, what happened. But I think part of it, uh, Damon is like, we stay consistent. Like, okay, you're having some ups and downs. I'll talk to this year, some ups and downs. You know, let's be honest. The pitching staff had been more down than up, right? Like, but our, our offense kept carrying us. We'd, we'd have a, a good game and then we'd have two bad games. We managed to at least win one of those games offensively. Um, but with our st- staff, especially from the starting side, Blanco continued to get better. And, and and you saw that May he had. That was just him getting better. And then Joe Savino getting built up, giving that stability to now allow those relievers not to come in in the second inning, come in the sixth or the seventh, right? And then it was just about that one guy stepping up, which which Jay did. But we stay consistent in our work. You try not to hit the panic button, right? And, um, hey, if we were 35 and 25, it'd be easier to hit the panic button. But we were finding ways to win. And all I kept saying is, man, just put it together. And then the postseason hits, we kind of emerge at the right time. And our offense is still great. Watch out. And, hey, think about it. We hit one home run this weekend. Right. And we were three outs away from winning that game three to two and scoring basically a, a handful of runs to win a game, win three games. So it could have been could have been good. But you need that. We can't score 12 runs a game. We have to be able to step up and pitch, especially in the postseason. And I was so proud of our guys. And um, I feel like we've turned that corner and we're excited for the, the next challenge in Kansas State to go do it again. It was interesting. Uh, you guys mentioned Griff McGarry. You know, Oak made some parallels in the post game press conference about Griff's journey at, compared to Jay's journey. Yeah. I mean, I just remember with Griff, 
Um, probably one of my all-time favorite players here just because of the way he handled that whole situation. You know, kind of got out of the out of the starting rotation. It's supposed to be a big, big time arm for us. But you know what? Like, and didn't pitch for like a month, right? Yeah. And who's the first guy out of the dugout? That guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. when during the celebration, and everything. So, I, Coach Mack and Coach Oak always say the game rewards. You know, I thought that was a perfect situation situation where the game rewarded him. Um, but what was your your take on that? That the parallel between, I guess, Jay's year and yeah. Griff. I don't. I don't think Jay had a a, a bad year in at all. But, right. Um, expectations were kind of the same and kind of the same route, I guess, to that, to that culminating moment that was uh, Sunday. Yeah. Well, with Griff, you know, he had a big arm, right? Like with his bugaboo, the, the couple of years before I got here was the walks, right? Um, you know, he'd walk the bases loaded and strike out the next three guys, right? It was, it was like, you don't even need fielders, alpha there's just come on in and sit down and take a drink, drink break. Cause the ball ain't getting put in play. Right. Uh, yep. Um, you know, and then he, it, it just got to a point where you can't you can't live and die that way. You got to have strikes. But I remember this outing. He comes in, and we were winning like fourteen nothing, but we were, had a no hitter going against Wake Forest. He comes in the ninth inning, and it's like ninety nine to one hundred one, and it's just pills at the bottom. And we had guys telling John Henry's dad, Jim Henry's like, that's one of the best innings that one innings I've ever seen, right? Just how yeah. it was. And I remember talking to him. He went back down to the bullpen to grab his stuff. And I was walking down to my office to go print charts. And I saw him. I said, hey. And he came running over. And I got I got emotional. I was like basically like crying. Like, I'm like, I'm so proud of you because of like the last month, what you've gone through for being like our number one on Friday to not even pitching. But like you said, Scott, first man of the dugout, still excited, still dancing, doing all these things, but still work in the in, in the in the shadows, working to get back to to do what we, we can do, right? Jay, very similar. Like, yeah, he didn't have like as a total like up and down, but like was just inconsistent. And Jay's inconsistencies came from like not knowing who he wanted to be. Like, hey man, 94, 96 Jay. But then next one he wants to be two seam guy, like Marcus Stroman. Like, we can't, we can't have a bad game and then go over here, then go back and forth. You have to say, hey, I am this guy. This is what I'm gonna be. And whatever the result may be, it is, and I continue to keep working. So I finally said, hey, make a choice. What do you want to be? Is this guy go, yeah, that's what I want you to be as well. We're doing it. So I don't care if this Friday you get your brains beat in. On Saturday, we're that same guy, right? And that way we can continue to keep moving the ball forward. And, um, yeah, I know he would wish he had better results throughout the season. But, I mean, nobody remembers that. Let's be honest. Like, what people remember now is what happened on Sunday. That's it. It's what have you done for me lately. Um, That's what we live in. And and for him, from from a confidence standpoint, like, you shouldn't be thinking of anything but that because that's truly who you are what kind of pitcher you can be. All right. So it took to who cares, right? Cause he could be the reason we go and win a national championship and that's all you'll ever be remembered for. So. I think a, a kind of an underrated part of the weekend uh, and a guy who's kind of been coming along here recently out of your bullpen is maybe your most trusted guy is, is what Chase on Kate has been able to do. Uh, those innings he pitched against Pitt on, or excuse me, against Penn on Friday seemed so long ago now, but they were pretty pivotal because, you know, Penn did not go away and they kept in that game. And um, how has he kind of emerged, it seems like, to be that valuable option that you absolutely have to have this time of year? And I think back to 2015, right? Like they rode, you know, I'm not saying he's at this level, they rode a Josh Spores, right, for so many innings. Like how important is that reliable guy? And is Chase Hungate kind of coming into that? How is he coming into that position? You know what? It, what's Chase has always been the reliable guy, meaning, hey, he's the side armor, right? He... We've gotten better from last year. So maybe we've kind of, you know, side armor. Then we go up the top as well to help with left-handers and stuff. But experience, I mean, don't forget this guy was a freshman at VCU through like 60 innings and pitch in the regional down in, and they were 2-0 game, right? They were in the championship game against North Carolina in, in his freshman year. So, but you mentioned how pivotal that game was. Like you come against Penn, nobody can hit in the game, right? It's like just scratching it out, brought four to two and actually three to two when he came in. And he throws three and a third on 33 pitches. Like in a moment where let's be honest, like we talk about like, hey, not playing this game with relief, paying, going to win stuff and taking the fight to somebody. But Friday night, you're the Friday game, the one seed versus the four, and that game's close in the seventh inning. It's hard not to get a little tight and and like, hey, it's one big swing from the other team and whatnot. And he just kept making pitches and we were never in trouble when he was in the game. And it was, it was great. But again, you need guys out of the bullpen to step up because starters aren't going to throw nine innings, right? Um, 
yeah, unlike Sabor's where he was just like, yeah, I'm gonna come in and overpower you. Chase is more like gonna be a weak ball, weak contact on the ground. He might give up a hit, but you know the next ball's on the ground again. You have a chance to, to turn two, just like he did on Sunday night when he came in for yeah. Jay. But he's confident, right? Confident. It's amazing when you have confidence and then you add the experience of having been there before. Um, yes, he was there last year, but I don't think he threw in the postseason last year. If I, I have to go back and check, but I don't maybe think maybe once. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember him doing it. it Might have been Army, maybe the first game, right? So, um, so to have that experience of of doing it before and just he's older now, right? Like he's been around it, and you wait for these opportunities, and all year long he's been kind of he's been our guy. There's there's that scene in the documentary. Where where Oak and Carl are sitting at the table and sliding the index cards around, and obviously that's very authentic too. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was yeah. real time. How'd they get the camera yeah. in there like that? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I never knew covering that team that I never knew there's a crew with them the whole yeah, time. Yeah, obviously yeah. it's a dramatization, but what are those conversations between you and Oak actually like when you're figuring out roles for guys in the in the postseason and? We're going to save him for the, to start yeah. this game, or he's going to start the opener. We're going to go with Savino on Friday against Penn. What are those conversations actually like? Right. Well, obviously, that that starts right away. Like, it, that was started back on Friday, Thursday, Friday, when we were at the ACC tournament, right? Just, you know, forecasting out what we thought we were going to do um, and what has to be done. Um, you know, it's really easy if you have, like, hey, we've had a steadfast three starters. You could just go one, two, three and keep it status quo, right? But we haven't. We've had one, one and a half, and now two for sure. And now Jay adds that third piece, which is is, is dynamic. Um, but you're looking at what's the best matchup? How do I – it's winning the 1-0 game. I mean, the 1-0 game is the biggest game of the weekend. You know, it's not the 2-0 game. It's the 1-0 game because if you lose, you got to come back and win three more games to win the regional. So it was for us of, okay, Joe's a good matchup versus Penn. And we thought, hey, the best matchup versus Mississippi State is our best guy in Evan Blanco. Um, so we constantly talk about that. Uh, from a bullpen piece, you know, a lot of that's built up from everything. The, the encapsulates the entire year of like, hey, who's been consistent, these and that. But at this time of year, there's always one person that you're like, he, not as a come out, of, come out of nowhere, but you're like, yeah, he hasn't been in that role. And he steps up into that role. And when we were talking, I kept saying, hey, we got to close the game. I have the utmost confidence in Matt Augustine. Yes, he's a freshman, but every time he's been in a tight game, starting with this game, this game three in Miami, after we almost blew a third straight huge lead, he came in and bases loaded, got like a two punch outs, and then finished the next inning. And then the North Carolina game, we came all the way back. Tie, he came in, in a big situation, struck out one of their big hitters. We tie the game. He goes out and goes one, two, three. Then we take the lead and score three runs, goes out in the ninth inning and has like seven pitch close. I'm like, that was impressive. You no, know, it, it just, he attacked him just like he did against Mississippi state. Like he, he fall falter four or five pitches and then he got right back in and made those big pitches when you had to. And you need that. You need somebody to step up of like, Hey, I can do this as well. It doesn't have to just be chase hungry because chase can't throw every game. Right. So you need to keep having more guys. I always say have more guys join the party, right? Who wants to join this party of like, I can get it done. No, I can get it done. And, um, when you do that, you become more confident, not only as a pitching coach, right? But the players do as well. Cause they know like, okay, I'm confident, but if I don't get my job done, I know my buddy down in the back end is going to come pick me up. Right. And they start picking each other up and it's not like they're not looking into the next person they're doing it themselves. But in case it happens, we know that we're confident. And it's great to see our guys continue to keep building each other up and grow up in, in that, in that way. I know our ERA doesn't reflect it, but we're getting better. Right. Um, it's hard to change your area this late in the season. <laughs> it is it is what it is. But um, hey, we're winning games and our guys are getting better and they're picking each other up and they're coming together at the right time. So I, I, I think people forget how hard it is to pitch in college baseball to begin with. But, I mean, the past three years, I think UVA has had the low, fourth lowest ERA in the country yeah. among, in a three-year span. So, yeah. you know, there, there's, there's a certain side of uh, – uh, progress that has happened and one little blip on the radar I, f I feel like there's there's people that are freaking out about it but. well i mean yeah if you read twitter and stuff like that yeah that's my job <laughs> no doubt no doubt but kind of what i said earlier it's like what have you done for me lately right like unfortunately it's just the way it is and that's okay right like i can take it i've been around baseball i played for a long time like i try not to panic right like we have, we have conversations about how can we continue to get better and put guys in the right situation to have be successful. But like, I'm never ready to hit the panic button yet until it's time. And 
um, yeah, well, there's some moments this year. I was like, man, this is this is frustrating. But our guys were frustrated as well because they knew they weren't performing up to their abilities. Um, but they kept working. And when you talk about consistency from the top of leadership with Coach O'Connor, like that's where it begins. Like his consistency with our guys. And when you have your leader being that consistent, you don't do this, right? You stay this way. Yeah, you go up, but you never go past that that kind of even keel spot. So, again, I'm proud of our guys. And um, I tell you, I learned a lot this year because, like, you know, you're worried about, like, what your staff looks like. Like, nobody cares. Like, all they care if you're winning or losing games, right, for the most part. And and that's – we managed to do that. That's why it's a team game. And now we're just we're just trying to help our team win the best we can and uh, just keep doing it. It's a little off the radar, but you've been a part of – You've been a part of now three deep, you know, postseason runs, right? Since you've been in this position, and obviously, when you get in the, no matter the, the the level of this sport, you know, no matter the playoff situation, right? There's always maybe superstitions that guys yeah. do, right? They wear a certain thing throughout the entire. Uh, if, if one pitcher is going well, maybe you do something that you don't do for another. Do you have any specific? quirks or, or superstitions that you do this time of year right i'm not superstitious i'm a little stitious right on certain things uh like uh, i will always put my right sock on first uh they actually have the big r on the toe so it's easy to know which one you're putting on but uh <laughs> always put the right sock on first and the left and then i'll finish getting dressed um that is a no-brainer that will never never change um, when did that start was that like when always you were- always been that way okay since okay. i've been a coach right i don't think okay. i ever thought that way as a player i mean i just went out and played but as a coach i've always kind of done that and uh and whatnot but no i mean there's little things the pencil we have like uh we have our our game chart right here yeah. so like we had a pencil break maybe two and a half three weeks ago <laughs> and i can't i was like oh bro oh so i don't have any more and next one he got one from coach mac and mac has these certain kind of pencils and we started pitching well i was like all right we got to keep this pencil and so we kept that same pencil and it ran out there they said no no we ain't changing pencils put more uh lead in it right and so we've kept this same pencil and hey that pencil is going to stay here for the time being so um so i think we're all kind of dumb in little ways like that right, right? like right. more scoring runs it's spots you know don't get back to standing where you're at do not move i mean for me in the dugout i did it i did it <laughs> saturday night um i'm always down in the on the, by the end where o'connor and stuff is right but sometimes when we're not scoring, I'll walk down to where the other end of the dugout, to the, on the, the far third base side. I'll just stand there, hands on hip. Sure as crap. Seven inning, two run single. We're tied 4-4. So every inning, I went right back down to the eighth and ninth, and we walked it off. So um, <laughs> when, you need, when you need runs, I'm going down to the Gatorade cooler. So <laughs> so well, is it true Is it true that uh, – I forget who told me this story, but when you first got here, you were told – you weren't allowed to wear any college world series stuff, any college world series gear until you were a part of a team that went to Omaha. Oh, I never heard that, but I wouldn't wear oh. anything. I definitely wouldn't wear anything that I wasn't a part of. So, okay. Yeah. I know. forget who told me that story. Okay. <laughs> no, it's but like, I, I like that. I mean, that makes sense. That, that, that kind of be, now you have your own gear, right? Yeah. Oh, did you go, did you go? No, I never went. So what are you doing? Right. Yeah. Okay. They do that with the masters too. Usually if you, if you go to the masters, yeah, don't or be wearing a master's polo right. I've never been, right? Go. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> like a... Well, you can't get master's gear online, right? That's, that's true. Cool. You have yeah. to go there. So you're clearly a poser if you <laughs> like, get it on no or have a buddy get something for you. Are you saying Yo, Drew exactly. Dickinson is a poser? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not asking about his master's uh, yeah. per, uh, gear uh, situation. Pebble but, Beach. You know, the, the, um, the, the superstitious thing, I mean, back to like, I don't know if people know. I mean, some people probably that longtime followers of this program, but like, the dugout change, right? When the when the stadium expanded, yeah. correct? UVA had always been forever on the third base side, right? And then when the stadium expansion happened, the bullpen, uh, the, the the good bullpen, right? The the full bullpen is in right field. So for a few years there, right? Switch to switch the first baseline, and then it was the two down years. It was it was the only back. years they did not go to the regional, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. yep. So seventeen and eighteen. Um, 18 and 19. 19. 18 and 19. Yeah, yeah. You're right, Damon. Yeah. 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 So 18 and 19, I take the job. I get here September 16th, 2019, and they're in the middle of fall ball, uh-huh. and we're working out of the first base dugout, right, which they've been. And they're talking about – we're Oak and Justin are talking about we're going to move back because this is bad juju over here, right? Like <laughs> right. They had all the heaters up and stuff. So they took all the heaters out. They put them in this back room behind a third base dugout now. And we moved – when I got here, we moved back over, and then since then we've – well, obviously, the first year was COVID. I was here. We didn't get to play. So 
This is my fourth season, and we're two wins away from going to Omaha for the third time. So it's a great move back back to the third base dugout. <laughs> Does any opposing pitching coach ever like, what do you do? Like, because it's like the 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 awkwardness, right? Is so weird positionally wise with the right. dugout in relation to the bullpen. Yeah. So when that happened, they were like, well, what about the bullpen? I, and I walked down there on the third base on the first base side. And I was like, there's there's room here. And first of all, who cares how much room it is? It's the visiting team, right? Like they don't get the nice things. Right. Put them in, just put them in a little chair down there. They'll be they'll be okay. Right. Um, so they Jesse saw it enough room. They built that new mound. I actually love it that it's straight out from us because when you're in the game, you can look just pick your head up and be looking at what's going on out there, have communication with them on the phone or a walkie talkie. Um, and the main reason there's only one bullpen is because they wanted to charge like three extra million dollars to build the other one out in left field, which I'm under the impression that after the season, we're building the other one out in left field. So oh, yeah, breaking news, news. breaking yeah. news on yeah. the, uh, I think, but don't quote <laughs> me on that. Don't make Justin. <laughs> <money>. <laughs> I'm lying. I'm lying. That's not happening. It's not happening. This would be a good test to see if Justin actually listens. Right. Yeah. There we'll, we'll exactly. see. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, like like Andrew said, you've been here. You've been here for four full. Se- this is your fourth full season right. now. This is the third time you've been in the Super Regional. You've been to Omaha twice. I don't know what your expectations were when you took this job, but but how how, how have you enjoyed this experience so far? I talk about this all the time, Damon. So I was at my alma mater, Illinois, the only place I coached at. Right, um, we had some really good years in the eight years I was there, but I wanted more. Right. Like I, I thought I was doing a good job and I, I felt like I wanted to go to that next step in my my coaching career and and be at a place that simple as this, that the expectation is to win. And if you don't win, they fire you. But when you win, they take care of you, not only just financially, but like everything you need resourceful to help keep making these players get better and get the best players possible and to have these amazing experiences. Um, did I think I'd go to Omaha my first year? No. I mean, your whole dream of life. I played in college baseball. The dream was always go to Omaha Went to one regional in four years. Right. And then I went to 13, 15 and three, three at Illinois in the eight years with two times being the first team left out, you know, which sucked. So it could have been easily five, but it had a super regional. We lost to Vanderbilt in 2015, which then kind of the cool connection is then Virginia beats them. Right. So, um, so to go that first year, it was a whirlwind and it was right out of COVID. So it was a little different, but it was still great. Right. But then they go right away back again two years later. It was like this was even more exciting going back last year. The, the experience and obviously I would never get old, but it, it it's not lost on me how how lucky and, and special it's been to now have another a third time to go back in four years. Like it's not that easy. It's really not right to go to Omaha. There's I mean, look at East Carolina, how great of baseball teams they've had year in and year out. And they just can't break through. And there's a lot of teams like that. Right. Um I'm anxious for, to get back, and I'm anxious to stay there for two weeks. I can tell you that. So, had you gone at all as a fan or anything beforehand? It was is never, yeah, never in my life. The only time I'd been there was for the, the big. We started hosting the Big Ten tournament there. That's right. Yeah. When that first happened in 2013, actually 2014, the first year, I was like not happy about it because yeah. I was like, I don't want to go to Omaha for the Big Ten. I want to go to Omaha for Omaha. Yeah. Right. I didn't want my first time to be in that, like to be in the Big Ten tournament. But I will say when we went there, it was phenomenal. And you're like, OK, how it's perfectly set up with a stadium, with the two locker rooms, the holding rooms. It's perfectly built for a tournament. Right. Um, the ballpark was great. The city's great. And we had some good crowds because of Nebraska being in it. But um, being there in 21 with those sold out crowds and just the atmosphere around the, the park, it's like people ask what it's like. You try to explain to them and articulate it. You can't. You just either have to be a part of it or not. And to be on the player side, like when we leave the hotel and you have like 12 bike cops just waving around you everywhere and everybody's waving at you and you might be going to practice or a, a restaurant. So it's just it's an unreal scene. Um, and it's just an experience that can never be taken away from these guys. And to when guys come to Virginia, like let's be honest, they have a legit shot to go to Omaha every single year. And what more can you ask for as an incoming player? to have that opportunity do you speaking of omaha and omaha's you know favorite son do you ever get <laughs> confused for oak when you guys have your hats you guys have your uniform on the tv people all the time all right? the time 
<laughs> and, like, and I know, I know Oak's not that old. Let's be honest, right? I know he's like, I don't know, maybe 53, maybe, right? And I just turned 44, but I, my hair has gotten really gray in the last four years. I think it's just the stress of Virginia baseball. It's his job, right? right? Um, it's the job. But that's okay, right? It's rewarding. But yeah, with our hat on, I'm like, Coach Oak. I'm like, no, it's not me. But and he's down there. But yeah, we're kind of similar heights, similar body types, mm -hmm. right? But yeah, all the time. And now I just start to people I don't know. I just ignore them. I'm like, I no, it's not right. Like, it's uncanny though. It really is. Like, yeah, with the hat on. Yeah, he usually has glasses on. I do not wear glasses. I wear true, contact. True. He has glasses on and, and and whatnot. So, but yeah, if you're far away, I it, I don't know when that started. Maybe last year, two years. Excuse me, two years ago. But uh, yeah, it has happened uh, more than once. I can tell you that. <laughs> the TV cameras make that mistake all the time yep. when you guys are on TV. Yeah. They're always yeah, like Coach Brian O'Connor, and it's the <laughs> first year. There you are. No, <laughs> and we're like, no, that's not him. So. No one ever scans down to the number on. That's what they got up to the number yep. on the jersey, right? Yep. Twenty six yep. and forty one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or where he stands, right? He always stands like in the kind of the right. opening, right? Where I'm right. on, where I when, only when I'm calling pitches, I'm on the on the rail. So um, he's kind of no, no matter where we're at, he's going to be in that opening. I'm going to be on the rail or whatnot, but. Yeah. It is what it is. So <laughs> he's able to hide in our dugout. Like yeah, really hey, there's worse. There, there's worse things of being uh, right. thought of as, as Brian O'Connor, right? I could, <laughs> I, could, I, could, I could do worse. I can tell you that. <laughs> what's it like? What's it like? You were talking about you took this job because you wanted to coach at a, a school where you were expected to win every year. What's it like recruiting to a school like that? How, how would you compare what it was like recruiting in Illinois to recruiting here? A lot. It, it, our net is a lot wider, right? When I was at Illinois, um, <clears throat> there was no recipro reciprocation of like in-state tuition. So it was, when you're Illinois, in-state tuition, great. You, you walk right out the borders, it doubled it right away. So, And when you only have 11.7 scholarships, um, it was tough to get guys. So you had to really crush Chicago and whatnot. But at the same time, Louisville, Vanderbilt, LSU are crushing Chicago. So you're you're not going to beat those guys for those for those guys. You tried. It wasn't for the lack of trying, but you just didn't. And now here, it's kind of nice to be in the mix for guys and actually have a real shot to get the top players in the country. Um, now, mind you, every top SEC and ACC school are on, on them as well, but that's okay, right? You you just try to sell the development and the the history and the facts of our winning program and and whatnot. But we still have our pockets of players that we get in certain areas, but. The net is definitely coast to coast, but I mean, let's be honest, not many California kids are coming out to here, right? Griff McGarry was a California kid, ironically enough, but, uh, you know, we still crushed the New Jersey and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania area. I remember getting here, like being a, a, a Midwest guy, I never been up that way before. Knowing how many people are literally in the New Jersey and Eastern PA, it's like so densely populated. You could build a Omaha caliber team by just staying in that right, that <laughs> tri-state area and you have a phenomenal club, right? If you look at all the greats from the last 10, 12 years, how many guys are from New Jersey and PA? It's a high, high amount. Who was the, uh, who was the first pitcher to commit to you when you got there? Do you remember? Yeah. And you know what it was? It was actually, uh, was it was it Colin McKay? It might have been Colin McKay. Yeah, okay. because it, it was Colin because the twenty two class was already all done. Yeah, that's right. Nice. Figure out what the first class would have been. It would have been. So my, yeah. And then twenty three. The, the freshman this year was my first class, and that was all done on video. Right. And right. right. Because of COVID, so I like to think my first real class of actually going out and getting to actually watch them play, right, would have been our twenty four class that's coming in, uh, hopefully in a couple of months, and hopefully they all get here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Knock on wood. Knock on wood is right. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, you're doing, you're doing your job right, right? right? right. Um, and also pick, getting the right players. I mean, it's one thing to get right the right talented players in here, but we also look for the right men too, right? Like the right culture. I mean, you, you, you guys have been around this program for a long time. Culture is king here, right? And that culture is built from the, from the coaches, yes, but then the players then sustain it and run it, right? So you got to have the right players. And then when you have right players who then are all talented – you get the opportunities that we have this weekend. All right. That seems like a pretty good place to, uh, to wrap things up. Anybody else got anything for coach Drew? Oh, it's good. good. It's 
good all right man well we will let you go i know you got i know you and oak got to sit down there at the table with the index cards right <laughs> yeah. right no we're good to go where's we're good to go on this weekend Let's, can you uh, move your move your laptop to show us where the documentary film <laughs> yeah, right. so, so, yeah. let everybody know that that's that's going to be real right sure no i i gotta get started on the uh, kansas state report and get that going so we can have our pitchers meeting tomorrow about it so that's fine that's the number one focus for the rest of the day all yeah. right Sounds good. Seven right. o'clock Friday night here at the Dish. It's the Who's in Kansas State, game one of the Super Regional. Who's are two wins away from another trip to Omaha. We will see how things unfold this weekend. Drew, thanks for joining us. For Andrew, for, for Scott, me. I'm Damon. As always, thanks for joining us here on 1186 The Podcast.